Uh, brothers, the purpose of our virtual Masonic education is to help us come together as men and Masons and talk about Freemasonry, figure out how we could be better men, better fathers, better husbands, etc. So may we all come together to learn tonight, to subdue our passions, to discipline our minds, and to improve ourselves through the tools of Freemasonry. Any opinions expressed during this virtual Masonic education series are those of the presenter, and they do not necessarily reflect the views of any lodge or grand lodge or the Rubicon Masonic Society. So if you are dis dissatisfied with tonight's uh, presentation, you can give Kirk White your uh, your peace of mind. <laughs> uh, full uh, disclaimer can be found RubiconMasonicSociety.com slash disclaimer. As you all know, these are not tiled meetings. Masons and non-Masons are more than welcome to attend and participate. So please be mindful, brothers, that anything discussed should be suitable for Masons of all degrees, as well as non-Masons. Please be gentlemanly manners. No alcohol, no smoking, no food, no foul language, all the other things that we typically ask you to do on a regular meeting occasion. In an effort to best assure that these meetings go well, please uh, a recommended attire for each meeting is coat and tie. Uh, please type your name and any appropriate title under your video to identify yourself to others. If you're not a Mason, please simply type guest after your name. Please enable your video camera. Please keep your microphone muted. Turn off all other programs. And please be patient, as always, should technical difficulties occur. Brothers, tonight's presenter is Worship Brother Kirk White, and he will be presenting on Operative Masonry, a manual for restoring light and vitality to the fraternity. And Worship Brother John Bizak, will you please do the honors of introducing our special guest? Thank you, brother. Kirk White is the current Grand Junior Warden of the Grand Lodge of Vermont. He's past master of the Bonacy Lodge, number 112. He holds a Bachelor of Arts in Psychology and Religion and a Master's in Counseling. And he's done postgraduate study in transpersonal psychology, specializing in initiatic techniques and the psychology of personal transformation and consciousness change. Brother Kirk is a Vermont state legislator, licensed acupuncturist, author, and lecturer. And tonight he'll be speaking to us about his uh, very popular book, Operative Freemasonry. Brother Kirk, the floor is yours. And I believe your microphone uh, is also. Here we go. Yep. Th thank you, brothers. Uh, it's an honor and a pleasure to be here with you and uh, to have this opportunity to to um, talk a little bit about, about uh, the things that are covered in my book, but also some of the things that um, sort of brought about the, the, my desire and impetus to uh, publish the book and, and why I still feel like there's some important things that we can gather from, from this movement. Um, I have a PowerPoint presentation. May I have permission to share? My... Yes, sir, you should be good to go. Okay. Let's see, where are we here? PowerPoint. All right. Am, are you starting to see my screen? Not yet. We still okay. see you. But then again, we've done 48 of these and I still can't remember to unmute myself. So. <laughs> You might be asking the wrong person. <laughs> when you hit share screen, it should let you choose which window you want to share, whether it's your entire desktop or a specific uh, yeah. PowerPoint presentation. Uh, so I want to share this document here. I mean, you should be able, can you see it? No, no. I, I don't see it on your screen. When you share, try to share with your, share your entire desktop. Does it let, let you try it? Okay, let me try this. Share. There we go, something's happening. There we go, we see your screen. All right, there we go. Now you can see my... Perfect. Okay, all right, you can see that. Yep, you're all set. Very good. Um, 
So again, uh, thank you, brothers. Welcome, um, you know, uh, allowing me to, to be part of this. Um, part of the uh, impetus was actually um, this notion that that a lot of our lodges, at least here in Vermont, um, were uh, dwindling, that we didn't have uh, members joining. And so, you know, sort of reflecting on why why did we, why were men not joining Freemasonry anymore? You know, when there was a time when every town, uh, every community had at least one and sometimes multiple ones, even in, in little towns here in, in Vermont, you know, you have a population you know, 200, but you still had a lot and, uh, and all the men belonged. And, and so, you know, what, what's going on? Why are men not joining the fraternity? And then once they're in, why do men leave the fraternity? Uh, which I think is an, actually a more important question in some ways, because, you know, let's face it, a disgruntled uh, uh, patron of, of whatever, it, you know, usually costs you more new, new folks than if you hadn't had them in the first place. And then, of course, the important question is, how do we fix this? And so uh, I want to start talking about, about these a little bit. Uh, so why are men not joining Freemason? Anytime you have a, a, a product, a customer, a business, a whatever it is, right? You, and and you're, you used to be super successful, and, and now business has trailed off, and for whatever reason, people just aren't coming to your to your. Uh, store anymore. In fact, I wrote a little piece, a little little story back when I was Grand High Priest uh, of the Royal Arch uh, that was called uh, Hiram's, Attending Hiram's Store. And it was this notion that, you know, Hiram mm -hmm. has this widget store and he has uh, little version, little shops of it in all the local towns and it's it been prosperous. And then one day it, it, people just stopped coming and and he had to try and assess what's he going to do? How is he going to address this issue? And you know, um, and there's a lot of strategies you can do, but first you have to understand why are things not working in your way? Uh, I think it's easy for, uh, you certainly see it in the fraternity where people will say, well, it's, it's the customers. There's something wrong with the customers, right? The customers are, are too busy. The customers are lazy now. The customers are, you know, whatever. It's something wrong with the customers. And I would argue that, 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 that doesn't work in business and it shouldn't work in our fraternity. If we if we put the blame on why people aren't joining because they've got too many other obligations, they've got too many other distractions, they've got other stuff like that, then I think we're missing the point. Um, you know, uh, so marketing, part of the, uh, uh, you know, if you have a business, you know, it, problems are either marketing, there's something wrong with you, you're not getting your message out there, uh, or there's something wrong with your product, you know, you're still selling horse and buggies and the car is now a technology and uh, or or you're uh, you you're selling the right technology, but your service is, is less than desirable and people are not wanting to come around. So let's start with the marketing piece. An right, important piece is marketing to the population that needs our unique population uh, uh, product. So as Masons, right, we we, uh, we need to reach those people who are going to want to join the fraternity and um you know at least in vermont for a very long time the idea was that um uh, was that basically uh, people were just going to show up and there was and there was no reason to to do anything out and you know in the community there's no sense in, in making people know who you were what you did uh they were just going to show up and and for probably the last three or four decades, uh, that hasn't worked. Um, the uh, current Grand Secretary of the State of Vermont, we're a tiny population and, and Masons, but the current Grand Secretary, when he was Grand Master a couple decades ago, there were 14,000 Masons in the state of Vermont, and now we are at 4,000. Uh, so um, uh, just to give an idea of the, the, the statistics. So what is our product? Uh, you know, if we're, if we're going to move this out, we're going to get people to understand. So the design, the, and this is, this is a monitorial, anything that is a um, sonic quote in uh, this presentation is stuff that's in the Vermont monitor and allowed to be uh, uh, shared in uh, non-tiled environments. Uh, the design of the Masonic Institutions makes uh, its votaries wiser, better, and consequently happier. And then 
such persons when associated together will naturally seek each other's welfare and happiness equally with their own. I mean, that sounds like a that sounds like a pretty good a good you know, um, you know platform to me. I don't think uh, you know, I don't think our product is something wrong with our product per se. But so, but who would be interested in something that makes them wiser, better, and consequently happier? So there's a lot of research. In fact, there's some recent research, a little more recent than this here. Uh, the Pew Research Center in 2020 uh, did a, a research of religious groups in the United States by tradition, family, and denomination. And as you may be aware, uh, the, the dynamics of, of religiosity in the, in the United States has, has been changing. And essentially, um, uh, all of the Christian churches in particular have been losing membership uh, uh, pretty significantly. And so, um, and so, and it, on the contrary, there's a group of people in the, in the country that they uh, have been calling nuns, uh, which means when asked, what is your religious affiliation? You say none. Uh, and of the unaffiliated people, religious nuns, um, uh, in 2020, the Pew Research Center uh, uh, did research and it came up with a number of 28% of Americans identify as none currently. Uh, some recent research just came out. One organization came up with 27 and another one said it's up to 29 uh, different uh, percent. So the number is, is growing of this folks that are identified as none. Now this, does not include the agnostic, well, this does include the agnostics and the people who say nothing in particular. It does not include the atheists. They, and uh, so they, these folks do say they have something, it's just no affiliation. Most of those agnostics and people who believe in nothing in particular, in fact, they found, believe in a higher power or a spiritual force, um, now by a significant number. And so it's not like these people aren't, aren't, you know, it's not like they're atheists. They're not like they don't believe in something. It's just that they don't believe in structured religions anymore. What they're looking for, they identify themselves as spiritual, but not religious. They're looking for some connection to, to the divine, some connection to, um, you know, spiritual truths and, and higher learning and those things, but not through a structured uh, dogmatic uh, kind of, you know, church setting where they're, you're told what to believe. You're, and uh, so here's your increase in among men since uh, um, that from 2012 to 2017, uh, 20, it went from 18% to 26% of men uh, are identified as spiritual but not religious. And if we think about that number, 26% uh, of all the, a quarter of all men in the country identify this way. And, and uh, to me, that's sort of our perfect, our perfect set, people who are looking for spiritual connection, community, and, uh, and an opportunity to grow spiritually without necessarily uh, being, uh, you know, religious, uh, where they where they can talk about the great architect of the universe and and not have to insist on a particular uh, name. One thing they found this was this has uh, been changed a little bit too. But basically, if you look at the numbers across, you'll see that uh, essentially, although there is some increase in the younger groups and the latest data that shows that that 18 to 29 per, uh, age group is actually uh, grown. And, uh, but essentially you'll see that across the, across the board, uh, it, it's not just a young folk are, are turning this way. Uh, it's uh, certainly more among the young folk, but there are uh, people in every age group that are becoming more of what would be categorized as nuns. So, you know, again, right, these, 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 these young men are looking for a spiritual purpose. They're looking for a spiritual community. And they're looking for ways to, um, you know, connect with others that, that are looking for similar things. And, and so how do we attract them? To me, they seem like the, the, the perfect 
population and perhaps some of the men in this uh, in this uh, class this uh, presentation here uh, come from that background and I think that part of it is because what attracts them is that it, now it's uh, more expedient only to oblige them to that religion to which all men agree leaving their particular opinions to themselves and and I feel like that's a piece that we need to to put forward in the Vermont ritual it talks about Freemasonry is not a religion but profoundly religious so that's the message and and I feel like we don't say that stuff enough and we don't reach out enough to the to to young men and sort of uh, give them that kind of a sense of of what we do and so uh, I regularly travel around to various things and people will ask me so what do the masons do and I'll say you know the design of the fraternity is to make men wiser better and consequently happier where, where, where we provide enlightenment or, or at least an opportunity to work toward enlightenment. And uh, and it's really well received. And people are like, oh, I thought I thought you just did pancake breakfast. Um, so, so then why do men leave once we do get them in? And you know, so why they leave is the product or the service. We think about the product, the product is our light and our education and our services, our ritual and our initiation. And I would argue that uh, one of those were better at than the other. Um, so I think in many cases, right, because the design of the Masonic uh, institution is to make people wiser, is worth the purpose is to provide light. And then once brothers have acquired light, they naturally want to go out and make the world a better place. But frequently, what we advertise to people is that we have brotherhood and charity. And, and so in many ways, we put the, the cart before the horse. And, and before we even educate them in Masonic light and, and do the things, which we'll talk about, about how we bring men to light, uh, they, uh, we're already just like, you know, we don't have time to do any of the Masonic education. We have pancake breakfast we have to do. Not that I don't love pancakes, by the way. I live in Vermont where we have maple syrup and uh, real maple syrup. And uh, so, but I don't think it should be the sum of our Masonic experience. So uh, I'm not gonna read all these to you, uh, but but I think the, the thing that makes us unique and special is, is our connection to Masonic light. Uh, that fitting ourselves to take our places as living stones in the great spiritual building not made by hands, eternal in the heaven. Uh, this little, uh, the second little passage, Masonic light is divine knowledge, progressive raising up of one's consciousness towards integration with the mind of God that transforms the recipient on multiple levels, including the intellectual, moral, philosophical, and spiritual realms. I think that that's what light is. And I think we, uh, you know, it's not just, um, you know, some vague, uh, other kind of uh, kind of well, gee, we've got some good fellowship here, and we do good work. But that there is an actual transformative transformative process that uh, when we when we bring people to light, uh, that it is as one would hope would be elicited. How do we do that? We do it through our rituals and initiations. This is the service piece of that. And the rituals initiations include uh, some of that stuff as use of secrets and mysteries, framing the sacred and the actual initiatic process. Secrets and mysteries. So, so this is Pike talking about, about uh, the, the, the secrets of masonry and that, you know, seek and you shall find knowledge and truth. And I think that that's absolutely true. But at least here in Vermont, what we found was that people were, I think, in my mind, confusing secrets and mysteries, that they are not synonymous. And so what's a secret? A secret is any piece of information that's concealed from others. My social security number, hopefully, is a secret. Um, and it's, but it's only a secret until I tell somebody about it, and then it's not a secret anymore. And so, so that's a secret. A mystery is a type of revelation that can only be conveyed by experience and is incomprehensible to reason. And how I equate this is, if you if you have never tasted, for whatever reason, you've never tasted chocolate in your life, I can describe to you 
how it tastes to me. I can go into all the details. It's a little bit sweet, a little bit bitter. You know, it's got this slightly bean taste. You know, it's got, yeah, you know, I can go through all the, the descriptions and words that I can possibly imagine and describe the, the experience of eating chocolate. And you will still not understand what it means to eat chocolate because the experience is what reveals the mystery. And I would argue that it doesn't matter how many times somebody reads our rituals, not that they should, but, but if, and, I, and I certainly don't, uh, I, and as you'll see in a second, I certainly don't uh, encourage us to just you know, let out our secrets. So I think they serve a very important purpose, but sometimes I think we confuse them with the mysteries and the mysteries are, are what we should be seeking, not, uh, uh, not just keeping secrets for the sake of secrecy. So use of secrets in masonry. Part of it is they provide an element of surprise and apprehension. <clears throat> the initiatic process should start the first time someone says, what can you tell me about, missing, about Freemasonry? That at the moment someone opens up that question, they are already have begun this notion of, of uh, moving toward initiation. Now, they may not get there, for every reason, we may not choose to accept them. They may not choose to join. But but that whole process of of kind of working their way through it, it, every step of it should be should be some, you know solemn, sincere, serious. And so the secrets create a surprise and apprehension. The surprise is of course later on, but the apprehension um, <clears throat> you know creates a certain sense of anxiety. And uh, truthfully, right. And I mean, I don't know about you, but I remember having uh, you know, uh, applied for masonry and, and then that night sitting, waiting, you know, before they, they, before they even, you know, take me to the lodge. And, uh, and so that, and, and kind of, that kind of fear. And, and as we'll see in a, a little bit, that that's an important piece. It breaks the cycle of reinforced consensual reality. Um, you know, if we keep, yeah, you know, we tend to travel in circles of people who tend to agree with us. Um, you know, our friends, our friends, because they think the way we do and they do the things we do. And so we all have a certain sense of consensual reality. And when there's a secret, then there's a hole there. And, and people don't know what that means. And again, that, that sort of begins the process of opening them up to, well, what's there? What's going to happen? Right? It starts to cause this, this uh, cognitive change that starts to open it up. It focuses your mind on that that's being concealed. If I tell you, whatever you do, you, for the next three days, do not say the word she, you're going to think about that word all the time because you're going to make sure that you don't say it. And so by my telling you to not, whatever you do, don't do this thing, uh, then I've already focused you and, and you're going to, you're, it's going to become a, a piece of your attention. So when we have, a, have the secrets of masonry and we have a new initiate and we're like, okay, now whatever you do, don't mention any of this to anybody okay, there, and, and be careful of your words. Then as they're being careful of their words for the, for the next period until they're, until they're ready to move on to the next stage, you're really encouraging them and focusing them on the things that, that you want them to be focused on. Opens up possibility of the unknown. In a way, this is uh, similar to the uh, breaking of the reinforced consensual reality in that they don't know. Right? You know it, it, there is an unknown. Um, when uh, certainly, you know, by the time you become an adult, you sort of figure, well, I, I, I kind of have a lot of stuff figured out. When you get to be my age, you say, yeah, I didn't know anything when I was 20. But when I was 20, I thought I knew it all. And, uh, and so, so this piece where it opens up this possibility that, that, that there may be you know, hidden mysteries. Yeah, and, and, I'm, and now I wonder what those are. And it, 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 again, it focuses my mind and it also opens up my curiosity and perhaps a little bit of anxiety around that and apprehension. But secrets are the tools that affect the mysteries. They are not the ends in themselves. And that's the, uh, they are simply 
ways that start to open up the candidate so that they are receptive for when the mysteries come through. <clears throat> Other ways that we that the ritual begins to transform things is ritual frames out a thing, right? Anytime you take special effort to, to prepare something, that already starts to change your mind. So, um, you know, if you think about, I mean, it, it, honestly, part of the reason why Christmas is so important to so many people, you know, why they have such strong memories and connections and stuff is because we spend a lot of time preparing for it. And, and the very act of preparing for it, thinking about gifts, buying gifts, decorating, all that stuff is starting to build this, this importance in this frame. And, and it starts to get us in the Christmas spirit, right? You know, and it starts to, to have an effect on us so that when the holiday actually hits, you know, then, then there's a whole, whole bigger experience than if we did nothing until Christmas morning and said, oh, woo, right? You know, it would not have the same effect. So, um, so framing it, do signs and summons, and I and and, uh, and I actually I just want to come back just a sec for the ritual framing. I do this whole. I'm so glad that this. Um, well, no, actually, I see it's going to be the next slide. So let, never mind. So do signs and summons is. Um, and in, in Vermont, right? We all take we all take an oath that you'll respond to all do signs do signs and summons is sent to you. And in Vermont, anyway, no one then sends that do signs and summons. They all expect that you have it in your Google Calendar and you'll just show up. And and I always have felt like, you know, you made some take an oath, and and then you there's no actual expectation. And that if you have no expectations, then people will live up to the expectations you have which are none and uh so that it's important that that you reach out to them again it makes it important an important thing uh you don't get invited to go to work uh, but you get invited to go to lodge and that's an important piece changing your clothes can change your mind uh if you've ever played a team sport or you've ever been on in a martial art uh, you know part of putting on your uniform is part of getting your game face on. It's part of, of, of changing the way you, you think and what you're focusing on, it, which is why I think it's, it's fantastic that, that the Rubicon Society asks people to dress appropriately, even though we're on Zoom. Uh, because just the fact that we all had to put on a suit and tie, even though we're sitting in our living room, uh, it puts us into a different frame of mind. And, and so uh, I'm always a big advocate of, of having more of, of that kind of thing. Attitude is in fact everything. So, so this notion of, of that we are doing something special, that's not just a bunch of guys getting together and we're going to recite some lines and then we're going to do some business, but that, but that this is a sacred act, that this is an important thing that we hear over and over in the ritual. But I, at least, I don't know about the rest of you, but at least it, there are a significant number of lodges in Vermont where, where it's sort of indistinguishable from every other civic organization. They're, they don't bring with it that notion of, of that this is this is an important thing we're doing. This is there needs to be some. Uh, it can be fun, but there also needs to be some uh, solemnity and, and seriousness about it. Lodge greeting. Uh, everyone should be greeted, right? You know, and uh, um, even if you don't know them, it, you know that there's a part of of again, like you're welcome to this to this fraternity, welcome to this family, and just people showing up, you know, for the lodge, you know, uh, and, and you're greeted by brothers, and they're calling you brothers, and that starts to change your, your mind, and, uh, you know, I, I have been, I visited lodges where I, sometimes I was even the featured speaker, <coughs> no one actually came to say hello to me until it was time for me to speak, uh, and, uh, you know, doesn't feel very brotherly, and uh, and nor did nor did it kind of help me feel like yeah this is the fraternity these are the these are my brothers that I want to be in so I'm always a big advocate someone in your lodge needs to be the person that goes and says hello to every person who walks through the door 
and then the preparation of candidates, including the application investigation phase. Again, this goes back to this when the process of having them fill out the paperwork is is important. It needs to be it. It can't be just you know um, you know here here's a piece of paper. I hope you fill it out. But you know to impress upon them the solemnity of the of the occasion that they're doing. And similarly with the investigative phases. Um, now uh, I'm a uh, I'm a big advocate for absolutely informed consent. Uh, I think that during the investigation phase, uh, the first thing that should happen is, is that the investigating committee should say, these are our expectations. And you know, we expect you to attend this many you know, meetings a month and we expect you to do these things and it's going to cost you this much money and it's going to, you know, and lay all that out and, and ask the question, is your spouse going to be okay with this, you know, and really be upfront and, and clear also that it's okay if you can't do that, but it means you're probably not ready to join the lodge either because we don't just let in someone because they have a pulse. Uh, and uh, so, and again, I mean, I'm speaking from some some experience, and and you know, there I think there was a time when Freemasonry was more about quantity than quality, and so and I feel like we didn't put people through either the informed consent, we didn't tell them what we expected, and and so then sometimes they've left because they were like, oh, I don't know, I was going to have to pay this much, and I was going to have to, you know, uh, you know, learn lines and uh, and those kind of things. And um, so I feel like it's important that we convey that. And 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 because otherwise, again, if somebody leaves um, because they're disgruntled, uh, the next time they see one of their friends, their friend says, hey, you were amazing. What do you think about that? And they said, well, you know, it was kind of lame. Uh, that spreads through the community and, and doesn't help the fraternity. Talk about openings and closings. Um, and, uh, Again, right, the openings and closings are important, the ritual opening and closings, because they frame and culminate the preparation. You know, we, we, um, you know they sort of, you know, now we've been doing all this preparation, now we're, we're ready to, to go, and everything that happens within that, between the opening and the closing, are a different thing. It's not just socializing you know, in the uh, dining hall or something. It should further the growth of light among its members. Um, you know, it should do that through emphasizing exclusivity uh, in that, you know, cowns and eavesdroppers are not welcome and that, that we and, and that we are in a special place. We are special people, we're brothers. And, and, and so it makes us feel part of the team. It also reinforces a common language and symbols. We'll talk about how we develop those um, uh, through the initiatic process. But you know, we, as Masons, if you, every time you hear the opening, uh, those phrases stick in your head and sometimes, and they're, they're not worded in uh, common vernacular anymore. And so, so that, that starts to change the way your brain thinks. And, and we start picking up words like Cowans and, uh, and that, that become a, a special language and, and only people who are brothers basically know that. And so, so part of when so we talk about the mystic tie and brothers recognize another brother, lots of times I can recognize a brother if we're in having non-Masonic conversation and they drop certain phrases and you're like, I know where you got that from. And uh, so, and then entrainment. Uh, anytime you have a bunch of people who are moving in a choreographed manner, um, who are saying things together, reciting things, saying, you know, so mode it be together, all those kind of things. Uh, what you'll find is if you do studies is that that over time, people start to breathe at the same rate because we're all, we all have to inhale and say, so mode it be. And, uh, or, and, and we, our hearts all start to entrain uh, in rhythms. And that over time, basically we, our brains start to fire in a similar manner. And, and, and that's an important piece because now we actually are becoming brothers. So initiation is then, of course, the next big thing. And there's a little quote by, by uh, uh, William Preston. 
And but let's talk about what Iliada said. The term initiation is the most general sense denotes a body of rites and oral teachings whose purpose is to produce a decisive alteration in the religious and social status of the person being initiated. In philosophical terms, initiation is equivalent to a basic change in existential condition. The novice emerges from the ordeal endowed with a totally different being of that which he possessed before his initiation. He has become another. And I think that's a critical piece. And if we do an initiation on a brother and he doesn't feel different, he just feels like, I don't know, I went through a thing. They I walked in circles and people said some stuff. Then, then we have failed that brother and they have not been initiated. They have, they have just experienced a thing that we did. So see, so see all, anthropologist Van Gennep uh, uh, broke initiation into three different stages. The preliminal, which is preparation where the individual is literally or symbolically separated from his previous state. And that's that whole preparation things where you're starting to, to talk about, you know, you know, some of it's the filling out the paperwork, some of it's the, now you're going to join something special. Now we're going to bring you to this place. Uh, I am a big advocate of, um, I know a lot of lodges don't do it anymore, but, um, but the lodge, well, my mother lodge I joined, uh, what they would do is they would actually pick up the candidate and bring the candidate to their and entered apprentice initiation. They picked you up at your house and took you there. And, and so you have already stepped out of what was normal. And you also have, in a way, stepped out where it's not easy to come back from. You've already committed yourself to take that step. And then as we know, there's during the preparation of the candidate, there's a, there is also, again, a uh, literal separation from, from their previous state. They're, they undergo some, some changes. And then, and then they, the liminal state, where they're brought into the lodge, and, and we put them through uh, you know, some disorientation, where, again, you know, they're, they're, they're trials and, and other things that, that, that sort of are not in their usual experience. And, and hopefully they are trials, you know, where, where that person is somewhat, you know, um, shocked and surprised and and perhaps even a little afraid um you know all those things to break you out of your your conscious you know where where you were and then once you've been through that that uh process then the post liminal is the reintegration through the lectures instructions and your mentorship where you now learn the new things so let's talk about this a little bit every thing that you've ever been when you joined a a thing, you go through sort of a, a process. This is Maslow's hierarchy of needs. It's very old psychology and, and doesn't necessarily apply in a lot of things, but I think it's a it's good um, it's a good example of what we talked about. Basically, whether it's um, boot camp or just joined a, a religious cult or uh, or you're brand new at whatever it is. Um, it, often when you're you're new, uh, you you know you go in and you say I know who I am and I know where I stand and I'm confident at the, at this stuff, um, and and then when you're taken out of that, you start to become more vulnerable. And actually, as you become more vulnerable, uh, you your cognitive states change, and so. So, you know, uh, you know, esteem is an important thing when, when you're a mature, successful adult, right? You want confidence, achievement, you want the respect of others. Uh, but if you suddenly find yourself in a war zone where really food, water, ability to sleep becomes an issue, you no longer care about self-esteem. You don't honestly care whether or not the other starving people around you uh, think you're a good person, you want food and you want to survive. And then, and so it, it's, um, you know, it's recapitulating um, the um, developmental stages of childhood when you're a baby, right? All you want is to have your physiological needs met. Once you have gotten those met, 
uh, as, as you move up into the ones and twos and stuff like that, then you start to build a sense of security of your body, of your resources. You get to know who your family is. And so you feel like, okay, now I feel safe. But, you know, you, uh, for a while, you're that little kid. And they, you, know, you, you may recall, you know, they'll run away from mama for a second. And then they'll run back, you know, to make sure, you know, that mama's still there and that the world's is still a safe place. After you sort of accomplish that and you, you feel both like your food, your, your physical needs are, and your safety needs are there, then you start to care about belonging to your family. That's when you start to identify, well, who is my family and who are my friends? And during that period, your, you know, your family is teaching you words, they're teaching you the language, right? You're picking up your language skills as a child. Uh, your family may have particular, um, you know, uh, phrases, catchphrases and nicknames, and, and you start to, to accomplish all that. And then eventually you work your way back up where you not only just want to belong, uh, you know, and so belonging can go into your teens. We all may remember how tough the teens could be um, trying to fit in. And then esteem, uh, where you not only want to fit in, but now you want to um, excel and be, be appreciated for being good at that. So if you, initiation basically takes you out of your esteem. I don't know, you know, I, these people, I don't know anything about what the words they're using. I don't know what's going to happen. I don't necessarily belong to these people yet. I no longer feel physically safe, perhaps. Um, and and so so it we move back down into our uh, into sort of a, a way of uh, a reset in our cognitive frame. All right, and then we build them back up. Opening, right? So we by framing the sacred, the openings and closings start to teach them new words, teach them the language. They start to see what we do. The secrecy makes them feel special. That gives them that sense of belonging where I, I know this thing. I'm part of this group. Not everyone is. So now this is who my my team is. Uh, you wear special clothing that makes you feel like you're part of it. You know, we participate in that entrainment process where we all know these things. During your mentorship, you receive the specialized language, you memorize the things. And so now you know the words and you start to have a, a philosophical exploration and it starts to open up your mind in a different way than perhaps it, you came in with. And and ideally, that's exactly what should be happening, right? You should be, you should be coming through so that now you can explore, you know, the the uh, the tenets and the and the virtues of Freemasonry, and and really reflect on. So, what is relief, and what is brotherly love, and what is truth, and you know, and what does temperance really mean, and you know, and how's that different than fortitude, and 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 to to really reflect on these these things that perhaps you didn't think about before you join the fraternity and because the fraternity expects that of you and in fact that's part of what makes you belong and what gives you esteem that motivates you to again have the cognitive changes to to become a different person and that's what makes it a real uh, initiation and so the mentorship is is critical uh you know it's certainly the solemnity the doing the the initiation with the, the, the particularly the liminal stage where where you know making sure that that's that's a powerful experience. Uh, you know, I have been in degrees where jokes were being told on the sidelines, and um, and 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 second during the the second portion of the master mason's degree, uh, a, a certain set of brothers were were giggling while they were participating in things that probably should not have been a giggling behavior. Uh, and so so what kind of experience is that person getting? Uh, you know they they aren't getting that that transformative uh, you know, of trial and ordeal that they're just they're just being led around and and people are saying things and and making jokes at them. It's not transformative. So mentorship. So then once your mentorship, successful integration in the lodge involves the new brother feeling included by the group, belonging. And again, that means people coming, talking to you, being, you know, being your being your friend, introducing themselves, all that, all that kind of stuff. New brother having something to do. Uh, that it was the thing. We're changing that in Vermont, but uh, it was a thing that once you get your 
your masturbation degree. They just said, okay, go sit over there now. And, uh, and, and we'll, and we'll call you when we need you for the, uh, for the, uh, uh breakfast. But, uh, but they didn't actually have a ritual piece. And so, um, I, I account part of, I think why I stayed with the fraternity was exactly because, you know, the day after I, I completed my master Mason degree, uh, they gave me, um, they gave me the opening charge and said, memorize this. This is really important. We need you to do this in lodge. And, and that made me feel like I belong. It made me feel connected. It made me feel like I had something important to contribute. And that I absolutely had to be there every time because somebody had to deliver that. Now, I'm fairly certain there were a bunch of past masters sitting on the side that could have done that. But it felt important to me. And that is part of what brought me uh, into the furniture fraternity and and worked me through through the stages and then the new brother having something to learn um you know education is is so critical uh, in, in all of this 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 stuff a formal mentoring process to my mind should include more than one mentor ideally a past master who has the the benefit of their wisdom and their years but also a newer brother uh i i really think you know as they always say the best way to to learn something is to have to teach it. And I really think that a newer brother remembers the challenges they went through when they were brand new, uh, that a past master who's several years to several decades down the road may not remember. And so I feel like that's really important. And I think mentorship should last at least a year. I mean, really good mentorship should last a lifetime, but I think it should at least be formal for a year. Um, so. So as I, you know, I'm, I'm not going to necessarily read that to you. Just the last line is, is uh, you know, initiation when done properly is the process through which uh, we make good men better. And by rent, rendering all men who conform to its precepts, that's uh, that's how we do it. It's through initiation. We make our votaries wiser, better, and consequently happier through the experience of initiation, through moral and intellectual instruction, lifelong study and reflection and discussion and membership. So how do we fix Freemasonry? We give our brothers the unique experience of Masonry. When we act like all the other civic organizations, we suffer their same fate. We don't, we offer nothing other than the opportunity to hang out with some people we like and maybe do some good work. And it's not that there's no value to that, but I don't think that's the purpose of Freemasonry. And there's, Mr. Preston, and that's all I have for my presentation. I, uh, according to my, I was told I had 45 minutes and it, my, my clock says I have 10 seconds left. So, uh, <laughs> well done. Any questions or comments or sticks and stones to throw, uh, you know, to go back to the, the previous warden. No, no, this was great. Thank you very much for putting this together and taking time out of your, I'm sure, busy schedule. Um, so I'll start. Let me take the screen back over so we're ready for the next set. Okay. All right. So, brothers, the floor is open for discussion. Uh, if you have a question, you can raise the virtual hand or you can um, uh, enter your comment in the chat. Either way is perfectly fine. We'd love to hear from you. We want to hear your thoughts and questions, comments. Uh, Brother Kirk, where's Brother Kirk? I want to just start. So, you know, this is an interesting topic, and I think these are um, questions that we have probably all thought at some time or another, and I feel like our group is very like-minded thinking um, for the most part. How much of this, as far as maintaining or, or keeping Freemasonry intact, how much of that responsibility falls on lodges versus the Grand Lodges, in your opinion? Well, um as a member of a Grand Lodge, um, I feel like, I don't know, here in Vermont, um, I don't know about anywhere else, but there, there's a, you know, a sense amongst the local lodges that they don't want Grand Lodge meddling in their business. Um, and, um, and so what we have tried to do is walk that line where uh, we want to provide a lot of resources and opportunities for lodges to have things that they 
can do for them to understand uh, and and even opportunities to see things done differently and uh, and then for them to to choose whether or not they want to do it we we don't uh, we don't try to force any of them uh, I, 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 know, I maybe I was grand lecturer at the time and I went around and I gave gave a talk on uh, uh, with your uh, that you don't have to read the minutes in every meeting uh, because it was a it was a thing it's still a thing where where they they you know instead of a consent calendar you know we emailed you the minutes you read it do you have any opinion you know all those in favor right you can just bang through that but but they wanted to read every single word and list every the name of every brother that was in the room and so I I, I sort of made it known that I didn't want that and I did a visitation to a lodge and so they dutifully did not read their minutes <clears throat> but then when they had their masonic education moment one of the brothers pulled out the minutes from a military lodge in germany and he said they're doing they have some interesting things in their minutes and he read their minutes and that was the masonic education i took that as a kind of um, a uh, yeah don't tell us how to do our business and uh, uh so so yeah i feel like the grand lodges provide the support uh, encouragement hopefully the direction um you know, I know in Vermont, our, you know, we have a, a set of uh, grand line now that of, of folks that really get what I'm saying and uh, and really want to start to make those transformations. We have um, we have Fibonacci Lodge number one one two, which we just got lucky with that number, by the way, uh, uh, because it is part of the Fibonacci sequence. And uh, but we uh, we're a traditional observance lodge. And at this point, there are a number of lodges that come and watch us do what we do so that they can go back to their lodges and not become traditional observant, but just take the pieces that they like. And uh, some of that's, you know, crazy radical stuff like do your ritual solemnly. Yeah. They, some of them have never seen that. And so it's so trying to provide examples, trying to provide resources uh, to make that happen. But I, you know, at a certain level, it, it has to come from a grassroots. They won't, you know, people won't buy into it unless, right. unless you, it, I mean, it's a, I think it's a feature of humanity that for the most part, uh, there's always the question, so what's in it for me? Yeah. And, uh, and so unless you can show them what's in it for them, uh, they're not going to do it. So that's our job as Grand Lodge is to show them this is what's in it for you. So well, there's open comments or open questions. Why are men not joining? Why are men leaving Freemasonry? Uh, Where's Brother Tom? Go ahead, brother. Got it. Uh, Worship Brother Kirk, uh, fantastic presentation. Uh, I've read your book. Uh, it's outstanding. Your presentation falls along right with it. Uh, the question I have is, you said mentorship is, is critical. And the question I have is, if it's critical, what if the mentors or your pool of mentors are unknowledgeable of everything you just talked about? How in the world that's going to shape their view and they in turn become part of the issue itself? So how do you break that cycle? Well, and, and that is indeed the, I think that is part of the, the problem that Freemasonry has is that for a very long time, um, you know, we weren't actually teaching masonry uh and so there's a whole generation or two uh that that don't even know what they don't know and so when they're mentors they're passing on what they know but but they're they're lacking a lot of those pieces and um and so i do think it's problematic and, and that's why i think it, it there's it's important uh i mean part of the publishing of the book was was in a way just to be like you know yeah, uh, help you understand. I mean, that's why it's called operative Freemasonry. Right? You know, uh, in my head when I wrote it, I was thinking, and that's why it's called a manual because I'm thinking, you know, this is an operator's manual. Uh, you know, it's 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 not a great piece of of uh, literature. You know, it, it's intended to be a small book that's easy to read, easy to understand, because that's what we need. We need uh, some basic education. So with the mentors, I mean. I think all of 
the, the brothers are in, for example, in a meeting like this, I mean, we, we need to be, I don't think you can, you know, you can't teach an old dog new tricks. It's not necessarily true, but it's a lot, it's really hard. And, uh, and so I, I hate to be this way, but I almost think, you know, we just have to move on to the next generation. Yeah, there's this, right, you know, the saying, well, it's always been this way, when really what that means is it started sometime before I joined. And it could have been the day I joined, but I've only ever seen it this way. And so I feel like we have to provide the model, the, the stuff that we can to the to our younger, newer brothers. And in a way, it's fortunate that there's the internet out there. Because what I see is a lot of new brothers coming into the fraternity who know more about actual the fraternity than some of the old past masters. And, and again, the whole thing is how do we keep them? Because they come in and they know that masonry is supposed to be this transformative you know, experience. And, uh, and then they come in and again, it's, <clears throat> it does not live up to their expectations. Uh, I knew a brother once who he was working his way through the degrees and he saw a trestle board on the wall. He's like, tell me about these symbols on this trestle board. And, and the, the past, ma all the past masters said, oh, that's not really important. It's just, you know, a picture. And he had been reading. He knew what a lot of those things were. And, and, and that marked the beginning of the last day that he was a Freemason. Yeah. You know, um, great question, Tom. Really, really good question. It's like the blind leading the blind or in the land of the blind, the one-eyed man is king. But I think more things like the Rubicon Masonic Society, the more stuff like this is out there, then it just, again, it's a resource and the people who are hungry for it will find it. And then they are the generation that will spread it out. And I think we, we just have to, in mm -hmm. a way, I, I don't feel like this is, it, it can't be a top-down thing. It, it has to spread by the people who, who have the passion and the understanding. The people who actually have the light, really. Yeah, I agree. Um, you know, I personally, not to go off on too much of a tangent, but some days I love Freemasonry, and some days it really upsets me, and that's being polite. You know, I've, I've had some friends ask me about Freemasonry and in different areas, and I've honestly told them that I don't think they should join. I don't I don't think that they would get out of it what they're hoping to get out of it. And that's it really upsets me to have to say that because I think they'd be great Masons. But it's going to completely uh, it's going to completely go against everything that they thought it was going to be once they go through it. And that is embarrassing. And that's unfortunate. And um, I don't know, we have to do something because it, it needs to die. It needs to die out to a point where only only the quality is left. We're doing too much administrative. We're not doing masonry. Dwight L. Smith, past grand master of Grand Lodge of Indiana, said it best. Just practice Freemasonry. Well, people can't even define what that means. Yeah. Let's start with the symbols on the trestle board. Why don't we start there and, and build our lodge meetings around that? You know, minutes and all that's great, but that's not masonry. That's that's just logistics administratively behind the scenes that needs to keep it going. And I think most of us probably would agree. But at some point for it to actually do something and change and how do we keep men? And I'm not I'm not knocking or picking on you is we have to practice masonry. You know, we and we're leave, men are leaving because we're not practicing masonry. We're yeah. doing pancake breakfast, which is a joke. Um, it, that's not masonry. That's an embarrassment. And that's why men are leaving. If you guys want to know how you really feel, let me know. And I'll tell you after the meeting. Uh, Brother Drew, go ahead. Thank you, brother. And uh, appreciate uh, Worshipful uh, White for your, your discussion this evening. One of the things that I really enjoyed was when you were talking about rites of passage, because that's one of my favorite topics in Freemasonry in, in its relationship. And, you know, thinking about the idea that as a society, we don't have uh, many things like that that work as a rite of passage for young men and the effects of that. So I like to look and see, you know, how is Freemasonry uniquely set up to fulfill that need? So my question for you is, from the perspective of having a transformative or creating a transformative experience for a candidate, 
what is getting in the way in that? You know, is there fear of, of lawsuits? Is there a lack of awareness of what we're doing? Is it a combination of those things? And in your opinion, what can we do to address those things directly? Yeah, um, I think it's a good question. Um, I mean, I and I, of course, I can't speak for lodges all over the country. I could just the ones I, I go to. Um, but I feel like the the obstacle in the lodges I go to is it isn't based on any fear. It really is. Um, I mean, it's inertia um, uh, at a, a very large way. Um, you know, we have we have past masters, uh, we have past grandmasters who uh, uh, can recite the ritual perfectly word for word. Do a great job. You ask them what any of it means. And they'll tell you that's not really important, All right? It's it, it. We have become a recitation society uh, rather than an initiatic society, and 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 so I feel like, and then so I I think that. Well, let me tell you what I really think. Um, uh, I'll take take a, a cue off from Brother Brian. Uh, Honestly, I feel like the the, the greatest generation, the, the World War II generation, came back with a lot of undiagnosed PTSD. And, and they uh, wanted to, uh, they had a strong connection, a band of brothers. They had a strong community focus. They wanted to make the, you know, their communities strong and well, and they wanted to do philanthropic things. But, but Honestly, anything that was going to to tickle their psyches was not something they were willing to go to, and so that was entirely shut down. and And so I think they learned the ritual, but they didn't study the ritual. They, you know, they learned the words, but they didn't necessarily integrate or you know any kind of thing like that. And and then they and they focused on the civic organizations, the charity, the brother all those things that were safe and made sense to them and then that's what they passed on mm -hmm. so i feel like we have a then a couple generations that never got anything but that mm -hmm. and and so i don't feel like it's necessarily out of at this point i don't think it's out of fear i don't think it's out i mean you know, i i think it's it's inertia it's it's what we've always done we don't know any other way to do it and uh and so I, that's why I think it's really important for us to to remind people what Freemasonry actually was about, and and to show them how that can be, and and it can be, you know, I've seen, you know, old war, World War II veterans who have been Masons their whole lives sit in lodge, and for the first time, the master decided to do the do the initiation with the lights turned down. And just can't by candlelight, and it brought this brother to tears because he'd never seen anything so beautiful and so moving. Just that one little thing, because they've just been—it's been sort of a rote. That the entire thing has just been by rote, and uh, uh, and so I feel like we 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 the more we can get it back to the experiential. I don't I don't feel like that it, it's it's. Out of any particular fear, I just feel like it's it's the way we've always done it. Yeah. And so brother, institutionally, brother. perhaps we're carrying on PTSD. No, that's a good observation. I think there's some merit for sure. Brother David Felty, you had a couple comments. Would you mind elaborating a little bit on your comments that you put in the chat? And then Mario, I'll get you to you after that. <laughs> uh, I was just going to say that if we uh, simply uh, let me be a little whimsical here. If we deliver, eliminate the excuses to avoid being Masons, that is just doing business, you don't need to spend one or two meetings a month just rubber stamping to pay the same bills you paid last month. Maybe have that quarterly at most, semi-annual uh, should be sufficient, it would seem to me. Uh, and uh, if, we if our dues were sufficient, that we didn't have to have pancakes up breakfasts, in order to pay the bills, then the pancake breakfast we did have would be for brotherhood or perhaps part of an event where we had a little bit of learning going on. In other words, if we could just eliminate all of the nonsense 
we would then have to be forced into realizing that we are, I think, first and almost, not totally, but almost exclusively, an initiatory experience. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and, and again, that's why I'm, I, uh, I, I, I promote this whole consent you know, agenda thing where, where everyone just knows what the agenda is. They've all been emailed the minutes, the, the, all that stuff. And, and basically the master just says, you know, uh, you, you all receive the minutes uh, unless you have any comments, boom, they're accepted. The, you know, um, and when it comes to the paying the bills, um, unless it's an extraordinary bill, I mean, I know lodges that vote every month on whether or not to pay the electric bill. Mm -hmm. yeah, and they take the time to do that. And, and you, know, you should just say, that maybe you do it once a year if you have to at your annual meeting. And, and I make the motion that we empower the treasurer and secretary to pay the, the necessary and customary bills for the coming year. You can do that. <laughs> I don't yes, think Grand Lodges can. allow you to do that, though. <laughs> I don't think Grand Lodges would allow you to do that with a change without a change in state Grand Lodge constitutions. And in, in Vermont, we, you can absolutely do that. No, you're yeah, right. Congratulations, it brother. Has to, it absolutely has to follow the Constitution, but it also needs to be in the bylaws. And those are things, as long as you're not breaking the Constitution, could be considered in an updated set of bylaws. So. And we, we've been encouraging all the lodges to change their bylaws. A lot of, the, a lot of our lodges had uh, their meeting days, times, and dues in their bylaws. And so then when it comes time to change their dues structure, it has to go through a whole, it's gotta be warned, it's gotta be two meetings, it's gotta be you know this whole, whole process because they have to change the bylaws to raise their dues by $5. Right. Uh, you know, and we're just like, put it in there that the annually the lodge will will you know calculate the dues and set set whatever is appropriate and that's all it says in bylaws yeah and so you have to start you know at a certain level to 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 find those obstacles and some of them are they're just built into the bylaws and so change bylaws you can if the grand lodge constitution has things that are are obstacles start working on getting the grand lodge to make those changes Mm -hmm. we're, we're doing that in Vermont. We've been uh, uh, taking all that stuff out of our, uh, out of our bylaws and we're, we're just making it a lot more uh, nimble. Mm -hmm. Kind of a segue example while we're still on the financial topic just for a moment. Rubicon Masonic Society, obviously we're not a Masonic Lodge of any kind. We're just uh, some brothers and friends that get together outside of Lodge. Well, we have recently become a nonprofit organization officially. So we have we have to follow certain more a little bit more structure and so forth. Uh, but we got to the point, and I think in John or Dan or Tom chime in if you want to, where when we were doing our meetings, our, our regular dinner meetings with brothers, the agenda was very business heavy, and it got to the point where it was very, well, what do you guys want to do here, and what's this, and it just very administratively business heavy, and. It got to the point, and John, I think this was your recommendation. I'm sure it was because you're the wisest of us all. Um, so why don't we think about having an executive committee or, or talk about business outside of it? And it led to creating an executive committee. So there, I believe there's five of us that are on this executive committee, and we meet when we need to meet, you know, a couple times a year, um, and we lay out how we're going to manage the funds and what we're going to do and everything business related for Rubicon, we're going to make the final decision. Uh, and then we're going to present it to the group if need be during our dinner meeting. So that way our dinner meetings can really, really, really quickly go through business and we can start talking about masonry. And that was kind of a revolution and a full circle here to finish it up. We had a, a meeting we had recently um, a couple nights ago, I think it was last Wednesday and it was more of a business style meeting where we had to discuss our bylaws. So ultimately, I think what I started to see the trend was it got to be a really boring meeting after that. And you can just feel that you're losing the attention and interest of brothers. And it just reminded me why it was important to do all the business outside of the, our Rubicon dinner. So that way at our dinners, we can be we can have a good time. We can talk masonry. We can we can loosen up a little bit and really get something out of it. So. I don't know if, if lodges want to consider that, but it's been really, I think, a positive output for, for Rubicon. Yeah, I'm, I'm a big fan of people creating committees that do the work outside of the meeting and they come in and report what they've done. Yeah. You, know, um, you know, around here, there's a golf tournament that a lodge does. And in the meetings for a long time, they would 
you know, so who's going to solicit this there and who's going to, you know, yeah. be at the 18th hole and who's, you know, all that stuff. And it was just like, have a committee yeah. that is the golf committee. They meet outside of the meeting. They come in and they say, we've, we've, we've secured the location. We've, you know, send the things where people are registering. It looks like it's going to be good. And, you know, you're done in like two minutes rather than, well, let's, let's, let's collectively work through this whole big issue. And yeah, no, I mean, you know, committees, executive committees, subcommittees, get people to do the work outside a lot, outside of the actual lodge meeting, because that's, it's not part of lodge. Yeah. 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 John, Dan, did you want to add anything on that? One, one thing about consent agendas, uh, we introduced that about 2016. Uh, it arched some eyebrows of older members. We did it. They are given uh, opportunity to read the minutes on a bulletin board or on the website, the lodge website. We have not had a single person object to the consent agenda since we put it in effect. Not a one. Nobody missed reading the minutes. Yep. For Lexington Lodge number one. Right. Our lodge, right. Mario, go ahead, brother. Oh, good evening, brother. Uh, thank you, brother White, for your great presentation. It's a wonderful thought that you have in mind, improving the way we operate and taking that, you know, to another step, like to the population who would be interested. But I, I am, I'm always worried. I'm, I really love the fact that you came to touch the the actual word of marketing because. You could be the best writer in the world, but if you never put out your books, you will never get people to read them and actually work on them. So we have this very unique stance as a organization where, for example, with the, the one thing I can remember is this bumper sticker saying to be one, ask one. And that is that leaves the whole initiative on the on the hands of the people out there. And it takes away our, you know, our saying on this. And this is marketing, right? I mean, you have the bumper sticker, but people won't be interested if they don't if they don't know what you're doing. So the whole idea is, should we do actual marketing? And in the sense that, uh, you know, without trying to break the free will initiative of the person willing to to join or or asking to join, and because <laughs> I, I was taught that that is what we are supposed to do. We have to wait for someone from his own true will to come and look for the fraternity. But I, I think that, that is counterproductive to our mission of welcoming more members, welcoming more brothers. I, I don't mind having another brother every night. I mean, it's, it's cool just meeting more people, finding what they think and, and you know, becoming brothers. But I think it's, it's counterproductive that we have that stance, you know, people having to take the first step towards us. And, and the, my question is, if there should be this marketing, uh, who would be the better, um, I don't know, committee, organization, or or group to push it forward? Thank well, you. I, I, sorry, I didn't mean, okay. Uh, I mean, now I, I do want to say that I'm not a, um, I feel like, I feel like the, uh, uh, Scottish Wright does a pretty good job about that. Sometimes I, you know, I, I have a love hate relationship with marketing uh, when it comes to Freemasonry. Um, I, I, again, I sort of feel like, like I don't think we should be putting ads on television. Um, you know, uh, you know, uh, you know, but on the other hand, there were generations where people grew up and didn't know their father was a Mason because it was a secret and he wasn't supposed to tell them, you know, and, uh, or their grandfather. And, 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 and that's just silly uh, in my opinion. Right. And, and so, so again, I feel like with anything, if, if you, you don't want to hide, you know, and make it hard for people to find you, but uh, so I think it's great to have, you know, events, have educational pieces, have a website, you know, all those kind of things. And 
and provide educational opportunities. I, you know, I, I will sometimes give talks in my community about things that would probably be a good segue into Freemasonry. You know, you know, you know let, let's talk about, you know, biblical virtues or what have you, um, you know, and, and then it, so that you make yourself available. You don't have to, you don't have to be hard sell, but, but, make people so they can see that you're there. And then if they are interested, they can come to you. If there's someone you know who you think is really good fit, right? Don't ask them to join. But but again, you know, make it clear that, that hey, I'm a Freemason and we do some cool stuff. Yeah. And and then and leave it in their lap to kind of say, hey, yeah, you know, I want to, I want to do that. Um so I'm I don't I'm not a big I, I don't know about you know big marketing campaigns, but I do feel like you know our better informed brethren and our brethren who uh, perhaps have the ability to give out go out give give talks give speeches uh, write things um, you know again I'm often writing little articles and putting them in my local papers or local things just small things um, you now. My personal Facebook page. I'm always kind of every once in a while I'll just drop a little Masonic thing, and um, you know, and it's not you know it's not any of the hidden mysteries of masonry, but it might be a little Masonic quote from somebody, uh, and uh, you know, it might be a Preston quote or a Wilmhurst quote or something like that. Just drop it out there, and occasionally someone will will pick that up and they'll say, hey. You know, and, uh, you know, what was that? Or tell me more about that. And then I can start to direct them to where, you know, where they, they need to go. Um, so, you know, uh, yeah, I'm not a hard sales, not a hard salesperson, but I think we, we also can't hide. Um, uh, but, and we also, I think it's important that when we're marketing, that we, that we're really clear that, we're not just inviting everybody in. You know, we are, or we should be, um, you know, very selective. And we only let in people who we think are going to be a good match for the fraternity who will, um, you know, and, uh, um, and that there's nothing wrong with that. But, but you know, just because just because I told you that Masons do cool stuff doesn't mean I'm inviting you to come over and join. Um, you know, we, we need to have a much deeper conversation. And when people will say, I'd like to have that conversation, then I'll have that conversation with them. And, and there have been times when, like Brother Brian said, you know, when someone lives in a town and I know that their lodge is going to be disappointing, uh, I may, I may, I don't, talk bad about their town. I talk about that there are different types of lodges out there and that there are some lodges that are really all about sort of brother, brothers and charity. And I don't, you know, I don't specifically say pancakes, uh, but you know, uh, but you know, that, but that that's sort of their focus. And you young man seem like you're interested in something, uh, you know, more philosophical, more like that. And, and, these are the lodges that I know are doing more of that, that are closer to you, or there's, I try not to, I try not to over proselytize our traditional observance lodge, but sometimes it happens. You're just like, mm -hmm. you're, you're, you've, you've come, came in and said, I'm really interested in like, you know, learning the mysteries. I'm really interested in, you know, and, and you're just like, in Vermont, there's only one lodge that does that. And you're going to have to drive a couple hours to get to it. Yeah. Uh, yeah, brother Mario, thanks. Uh, Grand Lodge of Virginia, I'm excuse me, Grand Lodge of Nevada put together a campaign, not just a Man of Mason campaign. And a lot of it was funded by Scottish Rite, as you mentioned, Kurt. Yeah. Um, and they were doing very well. And it was less of a marketing and more of like of a brand awareness style of a campaign. You know, they're not soliciting; they're just making people more aware of, hey, did you know that masonry still exists and etc. So, Grand Lodge of Kentucky, we explored doing that. There was a committee put together last year under. Um, most worshipful brother James Gibson, and it it just it fizzled. It didn't it didn't it didn't get put into play the way it was expected to be put into play for various reasons. But um, it was supposed to do something similar for brand awareness. So maybe it's not marketing; it's more uh, it's more of a brand play, so to speak, to make people more aware. Yeah, I think that's exactly it. 
And, but at the end of the day, the product has to be good, right? So why are men leaving when they come in? It's because there's something wrong with how the product is delivered in some instances, product or service, in many instances. Yeah, 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 we have to fix that in too. And uh, yeah, uh, brother, or, or Joseph Pierce said, we should help our brothers develop elevator speeches. And I do think that's true. Um, you know, if, if you've just got a couple minutes, you know, uh, I have an elevator speech for what masonry is for, for people who don't know. I also have an elevator speech for uh, um, when women say, well, how come women can't join? Uh, you know, and I and I have a very specific one that talks about how how the roles of men have changed over society, and and that really there's a generation of men who who've been receiving the mis mis these mixed messages of we want you to be masculine, but we also want you to be super super sensitive and feeling, and and we want you to um, you know and 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 so that. In a lot of ways, the fraternity is allowing, and, and my language choices is, is intentional here, it's allowing men to practice how to be modern men in a non-toxic masculine manner. And you know, that phrase, toxic masculinity, is one that they're all looking for. And um, and so if you if you point out that this is men learning how to be better people and uh and exploring what it means to be men. And, and in order to do that, you have to do that in the company of other men that are sharing that. And that's why we're a single sex organization. And, uh, you know, and so uh, I have my, my, I have all my little, my little elevator speeches uh, as a marketing thing, by the way, brand awareness. Uh, as a state legislator, uh, I, I took advantage of that. And uh, in the state of Vermont, uh, before every meeting of the legislature, we have a devotional. And the devotional is supposed to be non-denominational, uh, and uh, uh, and so uh, what I did was I gave a uh, basically I gave a little talk. I was like, so oh. you notice the speaker of the house uses a gavel, and to open the meeting, she bangs it three times. Where do you suppose that came from? Do you know that? that businesses and governments and stuff in the United States is the only place where they use a gavel to preside over business meetings? Where do you suppose they got that from? Yeah, and, and then a little talk about how our Masonic forefathers, you know, they were putting together this, this new thing, democracy, and, 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 and they borrowed from what they knew. And, and they, so they took from Freemasonry. I gave this little history piece and then I recited a uh, devotional that was given uh, by a by a brother and minister in Putney, Vermont, in 1841, and I recited that devotional. and And so, and the number of people, and you can find it on YouTube, and the number of people that watched that who were not Masons, who uh, were just taken by that, and reached out to me and said, "What was that?" You know. And so, I didn't. I never said, hey, and you should join Freemasonry, but I put it out there and people could hear the words and they could say, oh, this, this seems like something interesting. So, yeah. Uh, brothers, maybe one or two more quick questions. Uh, Brother Robbie mentioned in the comment, does Vermont conduct meetings on any lesser degrees? And what are your thoughts on that? We are allowed to. Uh, most lodges don't. Um, uh, in a way, in a way we're, we're, trying to encourage lodges to do more of that um, uh, because it's a way to get, get brothers engaged and involved. Um, again, for the most part, I, I, I would hope that they're running much for business in this lesser uh, degree. So if you have an apprentice, like, like right now, Fibonacci just brought in uh, an entered apprentice. We also just had one affiliate with us. And we've got another entered apprentice that's going to come in. And for us, it'll take them probably four to six months to get through their entered apprentice. We don't do the, you know, every month you move up, you know, we require reflection papers and study and all this stuff. And um, and so while we have them and they're all entered apprentices, we will open on the entered apprentice and conduct our meetings at that level so that we can uh, go over the lectures and really kind of delve deeply into, so what is going on in these lectures? And uh, so it's an opportunity to, to truly get them immersed and engaged early on rather than 
you know, sorry, you can't come play with us until until you've reached mass amazing. Because for us, that could be a year, year and a half down the road. Great. Uh, brothers, any other questions? Well, if you have not read uh, Brother Kirk White's book, Operative Masonry, a link has been put in the chat box. You can go to Amazon.com and search for it. It's a great book, uh, a lot of great reviews. I strongly recommend you add it to your library. So, And it's Operative Freemasonry. There's another book out there called Operative Masonry, and that's about the operatives. Yeah. Mine's so it's Operative Freemasonry. <laughs> I just want to make sure you, you, know, you, you get, the, get the book you think you're getting. Get the right book. You get the book. <laughs> Thank you, brother. Uh, just uh, housekeeping, brothers. Uh, Worship Brother Bizak, uh, would you give a quick update on our next presenter, please? Uh, sure. On uh, July, I'm sorry, June uh, meeting, we have Worshipful Brother Jerry Smith, who is with us tonight. He's going to be making a presentation, I believe, about the West Gate. Is that correct, Daryl? Uh, there'll be an announcement going out on that next week. We hope everybody will join us. Yes, you're, you're right, Brother John. The, the title of it is Guarding the West Gate. And it's related to some of what came up uh, this evening um, about uh, who, who we invite, uh, who we invite in. And, and let me say, uh, uh, Brother White, it's good to see you again. I uh, saw you at... Uh, South Pasadena uh, last year uh, for our for our I, Masonic Con. I remember. Yes. Yeah. Great. Work for Jerry. We look forward to having you. And um, I'm sure you'll do a fantastic job. Look forward to it. Thank you. Uh, and Worship Brother Bizak, while I still have you on the mic, would you like to give a quick update about the Philalethes? Well. The uh, Philalethes Society, brother, you see on your screen there, it's the uh, oldest independent Masonic Research Society in North America. It started uh, to serve the needs of those who seek a deeper insight into the history and the ritual and the symbols of Freemasonry. You can learn more about Philalethes by following that link on the screen. We'll also post that in the chat box for you in just a minute. If you have questions about it, please get in touch with me. Great. Thank you. Uh, we are still working on the transactions, brothers. We appreciate your patience. For those of you that are going to be joining us at the Festa Board and Conference, our hope is that those transactions will be complete and there is something you can take home with you. Uh, so there has been some technical difficulties behind the scenes, uh, more from a graphics perspective, but we're very close. The content's there. We just have to finalize everything. So thank you. It will be out as soon as possible. And for those of you who have not had a chance to watch the Masonic table, um, please go to Amazon, check it out, and tell us what you think. Uh, the Festa board is going to be very similar to what you see in this DVD, and we look forward to having your participation if you're able to join us. And on that note, as you heard at the beginning of our presentation, Brother Antonio Montica gave the invitation to everyone via video. This is 11th Rubicon Masonic Society Festa Board in Lexington, Kentucky, Spindle Top Hall. It's a beautiful place. Probably couldn't find a better place to have a Festa Board. Uh, dining, fellowship, Masonic education. So please, if you're able to join us, go to rubiconmasonicsociety.com slash conference 2023. Um, and then we have the conference on the following day, which will be a lot of education, discussion, so forth. So it will be uh, the best event we've held to date, and you don't want to miss it. So join us. And for those of you that have participated and helped us from a donation perspective, Rubicon is a 501c3 nonprofit. We appreciate your, your support. Uh, your money is put to work uh, for the good of the order. Any other final comments from anyone? Rubicon, brothers of any kind? Kirk, great job. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. Uh, Worshipful Brother Tom, would you please do the honors of delivering a closing devotion? Brethren, if you'll join me. Grand Architect of the Universe, ruler of heaven and earth, now that we are about to separate and return to our respective places of abode, wilt thou be pleased so to influence our hearts and minds that we may, each one of us, practice those great moral duties which are inculcated in Freemasonry with reverence, study, and obey the laws which thou hast given us. Amen. The motivation. Thank you, brother. 
Brothers, thank you all for joining us. Uh, if you know of any other brothers that might be interested in participating, they can go to the RSVP link on your screen. Next meeting is June 26th, 7 p.m. Eastern. Uh, we have a closing video tonight, which is in honor of the observation of Memorial Day, which is a week from today, Monday the 29th. So without the men and women who have died for our country and our freedom, we would not be here to uh, enjoy each other's company. So until next time, brothers, may we always be happy to meet. Sorry to part and happy to meet again. Thank you all for joining us. We will see you next meeting.